Jesus' name, amen. Oh, man. Well, Genesis chapter 4, and I'm just going to begin by reading the first two verses for us. They say, Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. So, sin... Adam and Eve have just disobeyed and betrayed God in the Garden of Eden. Punishment. God has punished them and Satan, sending them away from the Garden. And kindness. But with his great kindness, he's given them the gift of clothing and he's given them great promises to hold on to. Then this chapter 4 begins, and it begins with even more kindness, doesn't it? God gives them the gift of two bonny baby boys. God is still blessing them so that they can multiply and fill the earth like he told them to. You start to think, well, that's great news. God's blessing is still coming. But the sin and the punishment of chapter 3 are still lingering. And maybe we start to wonder, what is going to happen? How is sin going to affect Adam and Eve and their children? Jean is going to read the next bit, verses 3 through to 16 for us, uh, so we can see how sin affects the next generation. Morning. You've still got your Bibles open, I hope. Verse 3. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favour on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favour. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It deserves to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my Lord, my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Thank you, Jean. So sin, it has grown deeper and more ugly and more destructive. Adam and Eve disobeyed and betrayed God in the garden. Now Cain gives in to envy and murder 
of his own brother. The Bible loves to repeat things when it wants you to get the point. And if you look down at verses 8 to 11, it seems to really want to ram home. Cain said to his brother, Cain attacked his brother. Where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? Your brother's blood. Your brother's blood. Sin in their hearts is starting to produce really dark, stinking evil. And the passage wants to ram home just how sick it is that he killed his own brother. Not only that, but do you remember when Adam was invited to confess by God in the garden? He accepted that he did it, although he blamed Eve. Whereas now, what does Cain do? He doesn't even admit that he's done it. Relationship with God has become darker and even more broken. That's sin, so what about punishment? Well, if the sin is darker and deeper, then the punishment is greater too. For Adam and all of humankind, God said the ground would be hard to work. Whereas, if any of you heard, for Cain, he says the ground will no longer give you anything. And he's not just forced away from the tree of life out of the garden, he is forced away from the whole presence of God. I think there's such sad hopelessness in that expression, you will be a restless wanderer. You're going to go to the land of Nod, which isn't where you go to sleep. If you look at the bottom of your Bibles, Nod just means wanderer. It's the same word. You're going to be in the land of restless wandering, never finding the rest that you seek. And yet, sin and punishment, and again, kindness. Just like in chapter 3, after sin has been committed and punishment given, we see God's undeserved kindness given to the utterly unworthy. For disobedient Adam and Eve, God invites them gently to confess what they've done, and he gives them clothes and promises. And then here... For Cain, the brother murderer, God again uses gentle words and invites him to confess and then gives him protection from being hurt. It said the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. It is the sort of over-the-top kindness that seems so natural for God but would be so unnatural for us. I wouldn't give Cain protection after what he did, would you? I'd say good riddance. You deserve it. You weren't so worried about murder when you were the one doing it. Now you're suddenly very worried about it, aren't you? But even in the midst of judgment on this murderer, God is not like me. God is the father of mercies, and he listens even to the cry of Cain, the brother murderer, and gives him protection. Sin, punishment. And over-the-top kindness, repeating, as we saw in Genesis 3, so now we see again in Genesis 4. And we're going to take a look this morning at just a couple of things about this that stand out, that still speak loudly to us today in the way we relate to God. Spoke to me. But I wonder, as we read the passage, as Jean read it for us, whether, here in the verses read, whether some of you felt almost a bit sorry for Cain. I think some of us, when we first read this passage, think, oh, it seems a little bit unfair on Cain, doesn't it? He did bring an offering, after all. And then God rejects it and accepts Abel's. That's not fair. But what's revealed here is one of the biggest problems for God's people through the whole of the Bible and still today. And so it's worth us considering Cain's sin for a moment. You see, sin often looks a lot like worship, but without love. Sin often looks like worship, but without love. The first hint comes to us in verse 3. If you've got your Bible open, do look down at verse 3, and it says this, Cain brings some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Then his brother Abel comes and brings fat portions 
from some of the firstborn of his flock. Now, hands up, if your mum offered you the fatty bits of the meat for lunch today, who would say yum? All the nice, slimy, fatty bits. And hands up if you'd go, yuck. I think if we're offered the fatty bits, we go, yuck, that's <coughs> gross. But in different cultures around the world, in different countries, and at different times of history, they would have gone, wow. The fat portions of the first form, that's the very best of the best of the best. Cain brings some, but Abel wants to bring the best of the best of the best to give it to God. Imagine for a second that it's your birthday and two of your friends get you presents. Now, one of them knows that if they're going to come to your party, they have to bring you something. So they get their mum to pick out a random card and uh, just stick a pound coin in it. They don't bother to write a message, and they give it to you and walk away. Your other friend spends ages drawing a really wonderful picture for you with all your favorite things on it, and writing a really heartfelt message, a long, heartfelt message in joined-up handwriting to express just how much they love you and how grateful they are for you. Which of those presents are you going to be thankful for? Which present do you think will give you more happiness? Now, both of them did give you a present, didn't they? Both of them gave you something, but one of them was almost insulting. They just knew they had to do something, so they chucked something together. The other one wanted to do something and gave you something from the heart. One of them was out of love, and it's beautiful. The other was out of really grudging duty, and it was really insulting. The New Testament tells us clearly that Abel's faith, the fact that he loved and trusted God, made his gift better. The problem with Cain's offering was not that God didn't like vegetables. The problem with Cain's offering was that Cain didn't love God. Again and again, God tells his people, I am not interested in people giving me stuff. I do not need anything that you can offer me. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. Why would I need another from you? The children in Jam have been learning from Samuel this term, and this is what the prophet Samuel says. He says, obeying God is way better than sacrifices. Listening to him is better than the fat of rams. Loving God and wanting him is worth so much more than giving him stuff. And that was what was missing from Cain. God hates religious activity without any heart. If you're ever tempted to just do religious stuff, maybe it will win you some brownie points with God. Maybe it will just tick the box so you don't have to listen to him anymore then you are sorely mistaken. God says, leave that stuff behind. It is worthless. Come to me instead. It is better to come to God with thanks, praising him and enjoying who he is than to do tons of great big religious things. If you're happy, just for a moment, let's turn to the people near us and we're just going to think for a second... Do you ever settle for just doing church rather than seeking God himself? Do you ever slip into just doing church rather than trying to be close to God? If you're not a believer here this morning, if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, maybe just think this. Have you come this morning hoping for a bit of religion? Or have you come wanting the real living God? Let's just take a minute, turn to the people next to us, and let's think about that for a moment together.
great to hear those discussions. Do keep those going over coffee after the service. Uh, apologies for forgetting this notice earlier. If you do have seeds aids children, the seeds group is in the back hall there, so do feel free to take them out. Apologies for forgetting to mention that earlier. Uh, well, we all do that sometimes, don't we? I wonder if, as you were discussing, you were thinking of different areas of your life where it's so easy to just settle for, I'll just do the religious thing rather than really wanting closeness with God our Father. We don't have to work hard to slip into sinful worship. Our passage says sin is crouching at your door and it desires to have you. Building relationship with God takes time and effort, and we don't always feel like it. And it's sometimes not all that much fun. The closer we get to God, the more we see of the true state of our own hearts, and it's often not very comfortable. It's so much easier to settle for just doing some half-hearted religious activity. But that sort of empty religious activity ends up hating and resenting other people who have the real deal. People who are enjoying God and who are happily doing stuff out of love for him. It produces thoughts of things like, oh, do-gooder, goody two-shoes. Look at that person getting all emotional in worship. Oh, they've probably got rubbish theology. Those sorts of thoughts, if we ever find them creeping into our minds, they often stem from that place, don't they? We've settled for something less. And it starts to really grind our gears that they haven't. Empty religion without loving or enjoying God is a really sad place to be. And it leads to restless wandering. It leads to that sense of stumbling through life, never really feeling settled, never really feeling the peace that Jesus offers. So where does that leave you and me? Well, if we're in Christ, if you believe him, if you believe in him and you are following him, then he has saved you forever. You are his now completely. But the old Cain that old Cain-like spirit is still there. The sin that tempts us to half-hearted, empty religion instead of actually seeking God himself. The sin of Cain is not yet completely gone. The Holy Spirit is pulling sin out of our hearts and cleaning our hearts a little bit at a time, gently, slowly, but not all in one go. You will have days, and I will have days, where we see something a bit like Cain in our hearts. Just doing a bit of religion. Not really loving God. Resenting other people who are enjoying God. When you see that bit of Cain in your heart, that does not mean you are not a Christian. That does not mean you're lost. Recognize that sin for what it is. Be disgusted by it. And then run to Jesus with it. Don't give up and don't settle for the old Cain. It's a restless, sad place to be. But cry out to Jesus with it. Jesus, I see the sin of Cain in my heart and I hate it. Holy Spirit, keep taking that away from me. Please help me to love you and be delighted in you instead. We're going to turn to Jesus now to sing as a response to some of this. We're going to sing praises to him for coming to save sinful people like us with Cain-like hearts. And then we're going to continue in praise, offering all of ourselves to God. Not just a little bit, not just the dregs, but our whole lives, take my life and let it be. So let's stand, and as the music begins, let's sing in response to what we've heard.